I won't go through all the dates on the Bobcat Pell ceiling. Um, effectively, what this, with the shortened season, we were down to we reduced a number of pelt ceiling days, and and this would re put those back into the, back into the system, so there's more days for for trappers to bring their pelts in to be sealed. Um, this regulation all co also covers migratory upland game birds, and there was a, a framework change from the feds on on uh, morning and white wing doves. Previous to this year, it was only legal to harvest white winged doves in Clark and Nye counties. And there's been a, a slight northward movement of white winged doves. And so, just to make sure that somebody in Lincoln County or, you know, someplace north of, of Clark or Nye County, if they inadvertently happen to have a white winged dove fly through their, their shotgun pattern, they're not going to be in violation. So, it's, it's open up statewide that they can. To harvest those birds. It's unlikely, but this just is make sure that somebody doesn't inadvertently break the law. And then finally, um, there's a couple of regulation changes on on our wildlife management areas. The first one is um, we recommended um, moving the Scripps Wildlife Management Area and Washoe Lake State Park from being open on holidays, Saturdays, Sundays, and Wednesdays to being open seven days a week. And um, Overton Wildlife Management Area, there's one change there. Um, it was designed originally that Overton and Key Pittman were to be open alternating days. And somewhere along the way, the, the, the wording was a little off. So in the past, Overton said alternate days. And what happens is when you get a 30-day month, it ends up the next month it shifts it so that Overton and Key Pittman are open on the same day. The verbiage already at, at Overton, or, or excuse me, at Key Pittman already says that it's opening season, opening weekend, and all odd days thereafter. And this puts Overton opening weekend and all even days thereafter. That way, they would truly be open on alternating days throughout the season. And that's what we are proposing. Mr. Chairman, <coughs> just before my time, can I just uh, Russell, do you got any heartburn if we uh, were to move those dates a week as suggested by uh, the one letter from Ira Hansen? No, biologically, I, I believe that we can, that would That'd be sustainable. And, and, and it really uh, it makes a little sense because, like you say, uh, by the end of February, uh, they can't get in there anyway, a lot of areas. <coughs> right? You know, there's, yeah, well, Depending on the year, some years by December they can't get into those areas. But yes. Yeah. Uh, just for my own personal, uh, are these guys usually putting up uh, two traps per set? Is that, is that the? It, there's a lot of variance. You know, there's the um, a lot of years. On um, the reason why I, I kind of showed, I kind of showed that those those criteria I look at kind of in order, and the, and the trap days was the lowest because. There's so much variation in that, and on, there's years where we've jumped two or three hundred trappers in a year, and what it is are, are people new to, to trapping, and when that happens, an inexperienced trapper is going to have more trap days to catch a bobcat than an experienced one. So you'll see a slight rise in that, and so I, I kind of I, you can kind of figure that out, but the the number of seats that are put out is just it varies so greatly. Some guys, you know, will put one in every spot. I've seen guys that you know. The, We'll put, you know, going up a wash, they'll have half a dozen traps going up the wash trying to, because you just never know which way the bobcat's going to zig or zag as it goes through those areas. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Trump? Um, I also, it got by me, but I also had some correspondence with the president of the Battle Trappers Association, Joel Placely, and he asked for a season uh, November 1st. To the last day of February, and so if we did that, that would be a 120 day season. If we did that, that would go ahead and uh, satisfy him and, and take care of some of Hansen's request uh, for November 12th to February 21st. That'd be encompassed in that area. Would there be anything wrong with a with 120 day season if we went to November 1st to the last day of February? I believe that biologically the population. Season. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, 
I'm relatively certain Mr. Blakely is going to get up and speak about that. So anyway, is that it for you then, uh, Russell? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Very informative. Uh, okay. Um, I guess uh, we've had uh, all the questions from the uh, uh, from the commission, so I'll go ahead and um, I'll open this up for public comment. So, uh, Mr. Blasey, you want to start off? Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, Joe Blakesley, President of the Nevada Trappers Association. <coughs> I want to commend Russell on an excellent presentation. That was, that was, uh, there's been a lot of confusion about bobcats over the years because we talk in terms of <coughs> decimal points and, and uh, putting the data in terms of how many young animals per hundred adult females, I think, went miles towards making this more understandable for everybody. <clears throat> One thing I would like to say is that Nevada has the best bobcat management and data of any place in the world by far. I am familiar with what goes on in other states, intimately familiar. I've actually gone to other states and talked about it. And we have absolutely the best thing going anywhere. So it's 35 years of, of good data. Um, I've been watching it for 35 years and, and we've got a real good understanding on bobcats. The Department of Wildlife should be commended for that. Um, <clears throat> I'll, be, I'll be brief on a lot of this stuff because Russell covered most of it. Four years ago we had poor recruitment data and and Dow recommended that we shorten the season up a little bit, and the Trappers Association voluntarily went along with that. Um, I don't think any of us were concerned about it, but it made sense, probably politically, to do that, and, and it, it worked. Um, we had a two-year uh, trend of, of poor recruitment. Since then, we've had a two-year trend of excellent recruitment. As a lot of you guys are aware, we've had quite a bit of moisture the last couple of years. We're starting to see prey bases just rebound all over the place. I mean, there are rabbits and chuckers and quail in a lot of the state just going nuts. Um, as far as southern Nevada, <coughs> Tracy Truman's been out running a bunch of cameras and he's got cottontails and jackrabbits and chuckers running through his trail cams all the time. He hasn't even seen that for, for several years. It's, it's been fairly uncommon, but it's, it's showing really strong down there. Um, Russell went over the, the, the data. I don't think there's much um, more that I really need to say about that. Uh, the reason for our recommendation of the 1st of November till the end of February is, is basically November's for the Eastern Nevada guys. You know, they got snowed out last year. A lot of times you know, Thanksgiving or at least by the middle of December, you're done over there if you're in a truck. You know, you've got to go to some other form of transportation. So that's that's kind of to accommodate the Eastern Nevada guys. The month of February is more for us fellows in the West and the North where we've got, a, you know, the traditional chucker hunting areas. As you know, chuckers used to be done at the end of January and we used to have a month where we could go into some of those areas where you don't dare go because it's a parking lot full of chucker hunters trucks in, in February. Well, the chucker season got lengthened a, a week and the, and the bobcat season got shortened a week. So we ended up with like two weeks that we could go into Smoke Creek or some of these other areas where we just don't go during chucker season. So by giving us February, it gives us a little time to go into those places so we're not, you know, overlapping with the chucker hunters and we make a big effort to do that because we don't want conflicts with them. So basically the first of the seasons for the eastern guys and the end of the seasons for the, the guys in the, in the chucker area. Um, as far as fur prices go, a lot of people have asked me about predicting fur prices and if, if I could, I, I mean I would probably get into gold and stocks and well I am, but I, I would get into a lot of things and make a lot of predictions. Roughly what I look at as far as what's going to drive fur prices, number one is the value of the dollar. If the dollar drops, 
they, you know, most of our product goes overseas. So if the value of the dollar drops, they can pay us more dollars for our cats. Just because we get more dollars doesn't mean that they're more valuable. In 1977, we were getting $350 averages on bobcats. We were paying 50 cents for a gallon of gas and eight or nine thousand dollars for a pickup truck. So if you put it in that perspective, you'd have to have a two thousand dollar bobcat to equal what we were getting back in the late 70s and the early 80s. The value of the dollar is, is quite a bit less. So I look at, I look at um, the fluctuation of the dollar, and the other thing I look at is the value of oil. Russia consumes a lot of our product, and Russia produces a, a lot of oil. So I've heard that it takes 60 bucks a barrel for Russia to break even on their oil. If we've got $120 a barrel of oil, the Russians are feeling rich, and they're buying fur coats right and left. If we got $80 oil, they're not feeling quite so rich, and there's not quite as much demand for our product. You know, oil's been dropping right now. The value of the dollar, I don't, I, I don't know if it's going to go up or down, but if I was to look at it right now, I'd say that the value of the dollar is kind of neutral, the so-so on prices and the price of oil is making prices look bad. Now that, is that going to change between now and, you know, February when we usually sell them? Probably. But I can't predict it, so but I anticipate that question, so I thought I'd address it. That, that's basically all I've got, unless you guys have something else. Commissioner Rob. There's the new trappers that go out and what I'm trying to figure out is you have new trappers out there and your hardcore trappers. If there's a 120-day season, nobody has that kind of staying power to trap for 120 days with the check requirements, you, you know, your mandatory hours, you have to get back to your traps. The hardcore guys, how many days do they trap in a 120-day season, do you believe? 30 to 60. Thank you. Um. Uh, Joel, this might be more of a comment and a question to some of the cabs, but maybe you could address it too. Um, I'm all for NTA's proposal in the sense that it doesn't have a biological impact and it provides more opportunity for the trappers. The only reluctance I have um, is some of the cabs' support for the end out proposal, especially those cabs uh, we're looking at for the November extension of the season, like uh, Elko, Eureka. Uh, and White Pine. I don't know if you had any thoughts on that or, or not, but that's kind of what our thought was on that November, you know, moving November date up. So um, that's the only reluctance I had in terms of, you know, expanding out back out to 120 days. That's, that's fair enough. I, in the old days, I used to have more energy and I'd jump my truck and I'd drive all over the state and hit the cabs and, you know, I'd send letters out. And, you know, I, I don't have that energy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Joel, there was, uh, I recall one comment from the caps that on the front end of the season there was uh, potential for conflict with chucker hunters. Uh, um, but it seems to me that what you're saying is, is that as a general rule, the trappers try to stay away from the chucker areas. And so anyway, I wonder if you could just comment on that. Uh, I think it was Douglas County, but anyway. Um, Absolutely. I mean, the last thing we want to do is catch dogs, whether it's chucker dogs or whether it's the trail safe dogs. I mean, we all understand that's that's the worst thing we can do, and we go to extreme lengths to avoid that. When I trap around town, for instance, I walk past 10 good sets, and I spend that 45 minutes to get up on top of the ridge where it's unlikely I'm going to run into somebody else. But we, we do a real good job. I mean, obviously, when we catch a dog, it can be... You know, it can get a lot of publicity. But for the amount of trap nights that are out there and the amount of dogs we catch, we we do very well. It's gonna happen once in a while. I mean that's just when you have different people using the same <coughs> terrain, it's occasionally gonna happen. Um, my final uh, uh, comment is is that uh, I seem to recall that uh, when we shorten the seasons um, two years, uh, the last couple of years. Now, back when we agreed to do that, um, the statement was made that when the recruitment 
uh, when all the indicators show that the population would bounce back, we would uh, go back to the 120-day season. Is that my, is my recollection correct on that? That's correct, but you got to realize you, you had a different fur bear biologist at the time, so was, you, you can't, you know, what was said down by one person that doesn't necessarily transfer over to the next person. But that, that was said at the time. Commissioner Rain? Um, thank you. Yeah, but well, uh, actually, I guess it's some well, public comment. But um, I guess my just a basic comment, I guess, on it would be is you know, and also is I've I've actually been around on at least a half dozen occasions. I've had only well, mine or anybody else's dogs actually been caught in a trap over. I guess I'm a little bit vagrant. I seem to wonder. I've never had a problem with it. You know, oh my God, no big deal. It's not a big deal. You go over, you let him loose. Generally, they don't put their foot down on the ground. They don't every once in a while, you know limping for 10 to 20 minutes. It's just never been a deal, you know. And it's, that's one thing, and you know, it's the type of traps that are used, the spacers, whatever, we're in the wrong spot, you know. That's why those tracks are there in the snow. You should have noticed that <laughs> three years later, oh. But that's one thing, it, 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 it is an issue, but you go over, you release it, anybody can release it, kids can release it. Yeah, kids release it once. Yeah, you know, it's not, uh, it was the last one uh, two years ago now. So it's not a big deal. And I think that we could definitely have some form of compromise on these dates. I think there's plenty of space in here we could compromise. We'll find some. Could, I, could I address that really quickly? Sure, go ahead. The, the traps that we use, a lot of guys, we, we, we've evolved in our methods and we're starting to, you know, we found out bobcats don't have to have a buried trap, you can set them on the ground. So we use a smaller trap. The diameter of the traps we use runs from about four and a quarter inches to a maximum of six inches. So the highest vertical distance from the jaws close is three inches. So we're talking a two to three inch um, hold on, on the NAM. We're not talking about a big old trap with teeth. We're talking about something that big around. And you know, it's, it's, it's easy for a man to, it's out hunting chuckers to let them go. You know, I, I have some concerns about some of the ladies that look like a trail safe and whatnot, but I've actually gone to the Humane Society and done a seminar for them to show them how to do it and, and what to avoid and, and that type of thing. So, you know, we do the best we can. We, we also have a trapper education day every year <coughs> for the young guys and for the new guys that try and get in it. You know, and I always give them a lecture and I tell them, I say, in the eyes of the public, even when you're right, you're wrong. So think about what you're doing. Pay attention before you go out and set a trap. And, and like I say, I think we've been very, very mm -hmm. good about that. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any additional public comment? Mr. Belding. And then Mr. Wellington. I thought I would lie. <laughs> no, it's garbage can. Mel Belding, Washoe County. Uh, recently at the uh, Washoe Cap, I uh, spoke in favor of uh, the department's recommendation. Um, I'd like to withdraw that for the simple fact that I did not know that the Department of Wildlife Biologists were predicting the price of furs six, eight months down the road. Uh, Oil's coming down now. I wonder if that same article that was written that Joel referenced, or Russell referenced, if they would probably alter their value of what the bobcat's going to be or the pelt is going to be. Another thing I'd like to say is that uh, the 120-day season makes sense to me for data. All of us want more data. And uh, the longer that season is open, the more data we're going to obtain. I'd like to say something else about Joel Blakesley. When I learned, I was about 15, 16 years old, and I learned from my brother-in-law, and that was the only reason why I got to learn, because he was a relative. But I know several people that have gone to Joel Blakesley and learned how to trap bobcats. You just don't find that in a lot of places, in a lot of things we do. There's a lot of secrets that guys use. But I honestly believe that Joel Blakesley looks at bobcats probably like I look at bighorn sheep. 
and uh, he respects them. But another thing he doesn't respect is uh, the, the rest of the public, and, and that is just evident to me on how he teaches these guys and how serious he takes that. And, and, and that's a hell of a quality to have, and, and I think I need to say that about Joel. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, Ken Wellington, Elko County. Our cap did uh, support the department's recommendations on this. We didn't have a presentation. However, uh, personally speaking, after hearing the testimony here today and the questions that were answered, uh, I would have no problem personally supporting the earlier season, the, uh, the full length of the season. I just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Dixon. Paul Dixon, Clark County. Uh, we did uh, have a fairly large discussion uh, around this. Uh, Tracy Truman, I believe, was your vice uh, on my board. So we had somebody that actively, I think I have Tracy, but I also have two other members of my board that uh, I, would, I wouldn't call it recreational, but their kids trap like they used to, so that they run things. And so from their perspective, last year they basically stopped trapping in Southern Nevada. So Eastern side there because they lost days of hunting in the snow. So we very much support everything that uh, Mr. Blake's, Mr. Blakely presented here. I wanted to thank Ken and Russell. Russell came down and spoke at our uh, county advisory board meeting, which I found to be extremely helpful. We had, I think, seven or eight members of the public there who represent the Humane Society, the uh, Animal League, uh, Wild Horse League all there, and they tend to be very critical when we do things of trapping or killing stuff. And between Tracy, myself, and, and Russell, we were able to talk through why we do things like we did here today. And we really had zero criticism of this hunt where we were going. And I think that's the first time since I've been chairman that we've had this discussion where we didn't have problems. So thank you for making that available, and, and I think coming back to Commissioner uh, Shrum's comment that if we had our meetings a little bit earlier and we could move around, we could get some of your biologists out to some of these places. It made a big difference in Clark County for, for the discussion we had having Russell there. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Flowers. Washoe held their meeting quite late, and that's why you haven't seen any of our recommendations. We did go with the uh, recommendation from the department based on the information we had on hand. Um, this information wasn't there. This opens up a whole new set of eyes. And from a personal point of view, uh, I could support the uh, Trappers Association. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, Walt Mandeville, Lyon County, uh, we also went along with the department recommendations uh, because we trust the biology that are developed by the department. And, uh, but uh, we also uh, don't disagree with 120 day season. I think that would be good. One reason I'm saying some of this is, like Mr. Blakesley indicated, that the trappers, there, there's a lot of effort to, to uh, educate the trapping public. And I do believe it's correct that in the state of Nevada, they're pretty cautious about where they set their traps because one or two stupid trappers uh, can really cause problems. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. <coughs> uh, any further public comment? Uh, one more public comment. It's on. Commission Je uh, Jesse Latin from Trisha County. Um, we did have some uh, trappers show up to our meeting, and they expressed a desire for a 120-day season. And we didn't. Uh, we looked at the data provided to us, and we didn't feel that. Uh, or excuse me, we we felt we should just go along with with the 120-day season that we from the data that we were provided. That's all. Thank you. Okay, I'll uh, I'll bring it back to the uh, commission. Well, did you have a, do you have a question up there? No, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I did have a, another letter from Dr. Moldy. I'm not going to read this one directly into the, uh, into the record. Um, 
there's a lot of sarcasm built in that only Dr. Moldy would be able to deliver. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think that the take home message here is um, uh, the suggestion to uh, uh, tailor the bobcat season, uh, the mule deer season after the proposed bobcat season, which would be to uh, no management areas, open it up for four month season. On them. You, you see the gist of the, the, the letter. Um, I am going to give this to uh, Suzanne to put into the record. Um, I think if nothing else, it provokes a little thought. Um, I'll have some comments here in a minute myself for me personally. Joel and I have had some interesting discussions over the year. We had one earlier this week, and uh, I'll share those here in a little while. And I want to add that uh, there was uh, emails that went back and forth between Dr. Moldy and Joel uh, Blake. Likely, uh, with regard to uh, some of um, the comments, uh, well, it started off with uh, um, Dr. Moldy and, uh, and then responses uh, by uh, uh, by the Trappers Association. And um, uh, I have those uh, those letters. And uh, does the department have those letters? Uh, do we need to give them to you to get them in the record? The ones I have, some of them, but I will check my record. Okay. And, and one of the things I think Dr. Molding was asking for is, uh, is the model, uh, right? He, some kind of modeling uh, in addition to the, just the harvest data. And so you've talked about, uh, Russell talked about uh, uh, starting the process of developing a model. And so uh, it sounds to me like we're at least addressing some of Dr. Molding's concerns uh, in that respect. Okay. Any uh, other commission comment? Commissioner Drew? Just two, just two general comments, and it gets back to the communications issue. Uh, one, I'd like to see the Bobcat Bulletin finished as soon as possible, and I'm sure you're working on that. We've had some rollover in staff, so I understand some of the delays. But uh, I'd like to see that happen, and uh, in the future, the next time we go through this exercise, I think, Russ, the information you provided is, is really critical, so I'd like to see that go out to the cap. So just two general comments. Uh, Caleb. Change order here. <laughs> Caleb McAdoo, Nevada Department of Wildlife, for the record. Um, I just wanted to make a point of clarification, uh, which Russell touched on. Um, he alluded to the fact that the biologists had speculated on high prices, uh, and that was one of the reasons why we uh, adjusted that season. I think I would want to clarify that we do not speculate on prices. What, what we were looking at uh, was in conversations with fur buyers, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, was uh, a, a decrease in supply. Um, and it was our opinion that effort would increase um, as such. And as a trapper myself, uh, and I would consider myself to be a hardcore trapper in eastern Nevada, um, I never know what the prices are going to be when I go to sell my cats at the, at the end of the season. You hear prices is during the trapping season. Um, so there's always a certain amount of risk, but looking at long-term trend of prices, looking at supply, looking at demand, um, you can make a your own assessment on how much effort you think you should put in if you're if you're just looking at it from a financial perspective. Uh, so I just want to make a point of clarity there that uh, it, no one tries to predict prices, at least on our end. We we just look more at effort and supply and demand. So thank you. Thank you, Caleb. Um, I guess at this point, I want to just make a comment. And, and uh, it, it seems to me that when you look at everything that's been presented here, uh, especially the fact that you know the way trappers trap, you know, limited uh, uh, to areas just off of roads. Uh, you know, our concern as a Department of Wildlife and as a commission is always on the resource. And the question here is, you know. Uh, you know, that I think has to be asked is that is, that, is the trapping effort uh, that is occurring or could occur, uh, you know, regardless of prices or anything else, ever going to be impacted uh, uh, seriously uh, with, uh, with the, uh, you know, the data that we're seeing here, you know, with the wilderness areas and the fact that snows and the way the trappers trap, I, I, I see huge expanses when I look at that map of areas that are probably not getting touched. and. Uh, and that's, that seems to me that uh, 
to indicate that uh, while there may be localized areas uh, that, that might get uh, even trapped out, uh, I, I seriously doubt that, uh, that this resource is being impacted by this uh, by sportsman's activity here. Um, that's just my perception. I'm not a biologist, but I'm, I'm just kind of looking at all data, and it just seems to me that, uh, that we just simply are, uh, you know, going to have a hard time. Now, with that said, I'm a big advocate of, uh, you know, of backing up what we do with biology and, uh, and having that as the backstop and the final backstop. So <coughs> I think the idea of getting the model moving uh, and uh, continue to tweak that like we have our uh, big game model is, uh, is probably going to give us more defensible position, uh, you know, if there's ever any uh, issues that uh, do come up. So anyway, if anybody has any comments on that, I'd uh, like to hear, but that's, that's kind of what I'm, that's the message that everybody's been sending and what I, what I read. Okay, with that said, if I uh, want to entertain a motion on this particular action item. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I guess I would, um, we haven't really talked about the other items. Are we just talking about CR 07-07 right now, or are we talking about all items? The other, the other, uh, the other I apologize for coming in uh, on the back side on this one a little bit. Um, I'm, uh, I'm concerned with the Washoe Lake uh, State Park um, the seven days a week. I know that that's, uh, uh, you know, I'm not opposed to hunting that area. That's not the issue. But uh, I know that there are a lot of people that use that area um, during the week. And I, um, I think that the mix that's been there seems to have been pretty Somewhat balanced, I guess. It's not a real big area, um, but I know that it does get a lot of use from other other uses, and I just think that there was a, a pretty reasonable, um, pretty reasonable balance there. So I'm concerned about the seven days at uh, Washoe Lake State Park right there. My tenant, I, I guess what I'm saying is that it's one area of the, of the regulation that I wouldn't be able to support. I just wanted to put that on. Russell, did you have any? I've had extensive um, communication with uh, Washoe State Parks. Um, right yesterday morning, we had our final meeting regarding this this topic. The State Parks is supportive of this regulation. Um, they they took it out within the, the, their system for public comment and took public comment on the on the State Park side of it. Um, they did receive some comments from the public, um, in particular of uh, bird watchers utilizing that park um, their their feelings were that um, the the dead of winter when the, the duck hunting was going on they, they weren't sure how much bird watching opportunity really presented itself although they, they realized there's some um, but um, they they talked about the, the the times of the year when the marshes are closed because of, of the bird nesting and that that's closed for almost six months, and they said that leads six months of recreational use from, from these other user groups out there. And they said, well, if we take the full three months out of that six months for the waterfowl users, then it would only leave them three months, the bird watchers, for, for going out there and watching the birds. And we need to make sure that this is equitable. And my response to that was, well, if there's six months of use and three months of hunting, and three months of bird watching, that seems about as equitable as they could get. And they, they saw the logic in that. But they, like I said, they, um, I, I worked with um, Jennifer Dawson, who's the, um, the, the manager at Washoe State Park, and, and also her boss, and I don't, I don't want to call his name off the top of my head right now, out of Carson City. We, we worked with them um, quite a bit to, to come to a consensus on this, and they are in full support of this recommendation. I appreciate the uh, the update on it. I, I'm concerned that maybe that wasn't as, although it was a public process, you know, I appreciate the process. I, I think that it's going to catch a lot of people by surprise. And believe it or not, I mean, I have concerns with the Bobcat stuff. I was waiting for a motion to, to talk about it a little bit more. But, uh, um, you know, I, I do, Joel, I have to tell you, you, know, you, you really have, you, you and your organization really do step up to the plate when it comes to this stuff. And I, for, from, you know, I appreciate the fact that you guys do that. I know that it's hard to put that kind of stuff in the public spotlight, 
Um, but I think that it's a, it's a real good uh, show of good faith that you're willing to sit down and talk about those things, even though it's tough to get it out of the open like that. Um, the only reason why I, I, I would support um, some of the stuff in the Bobcat stuff this year, because you, I've, I've expressed my, you know, the, the biology, I think there's a ton of information there. I think it's all very usable. But I do struggle with uh, putting it into perspective, you know, adding in the considering uh, some of the discussion on the pricing and the fuel. Um, I understand that's all economics, but you know, I'm, I tend to be more of a biology guy. Um, maybe, maybe I'm a little tunnel vision on that, I don't know. I try not to be, I try to be open-minded. I've worked with the Department of Wildlife. I think that they know that I, I don't lock up on it completely. But um, I very much appreciate the fact that Endow is looking at models. Um, doesn't mean what we've been doing is 100% wrong. It doesn't mean that it's 100% right. It just means that, that it's, I think it's good that we take the time and we take a look at it, particularly with the bobcat, uh, with the fur bearers, and, um, and get a feel for, you know, is there another way to look at it? Is there another way to evaluate? Um, you know, what is our baseline? Where are we at? How, you know? Um, so I appreciate the fact that we're heading that way, and I, I look forward to seeing what we come up with. So, um, you know, we... Commissioner Ray? I'll try to take a stab at the motion. Um, I'd like to separate it in two portions. We talk about the season dates for Bobcat and Gray Fox. We'll deal with them later. Won't be able to deal with that in the motion. I'd like to approve the Bobcat move to approve the Bobcat pelt ceiling dates, migratory upland, and all the migratory upland game bird items, including the Overton, the Scripps, the Morning Dove, and all the other items that Endow presented as presented by the department. Second. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. Uh, any um, comment uh, with regard to that motion uh, from the uh, commission? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote, it, I'm not gonna support the vote only because of the Washington Lake State Park aspect. The rest of it I support, but I, that's, that's a tough one for me to, to get to. Okay, um, Commissioner Drew? Just to be clear, Commissioner Rain, uh, your motion is regarding page R2, R3, and R4 only? Correct. And you know, deal with R1 next, separately. Okay. Okay, seeing no further um, um, Do I need to take this back out to public? I think so. Does it been second? Okay. Um, so uh, the motion uh, is uh, uh, to approve as, uh, as uh, uh, proposed by the, uh, uh, the department uh, uh, the uh, bobcat pelt ceiling dates, um, uh, the morning white winged dove, uh, um, basically the change uh, with regard to the white winged dove, and then uh, um, the um, scripts and the Overton Wildlife Management Area uh, information. Um, so. Uh, uh, there being no further comment, uh, I'll go ahead and call for a vote. Um, all in favor, uh, state uh, aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 All uh, not in favor? Aye. Nay. That's Commissioner McNinch. Okay, motion passes. Um, uh, the next uh, motion, please. Right. <laughs> First time I will try this act. It's in spirit of compromise, if I could. Mr. Chairman, is we'll have, and first the bobcat. Any, anything we do on this, bobcat and the gray fox, have been made very clear to us. They need to be the same. So those season dates and spirit of compromise move that we start open the both those seasons on November seventh and close them on the last day of February. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, so this is for the uh, uh, season dates for Bobcat and Gray Fox run concurrently uh, November 7th to the end of February, last day of February. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, take a commission comment on that, uh, Commissioner Rob. After everything I've heard, I'm not going to support that motion because I think we should go to the full 120 day season. Uh, what I've heard today is the biggest variable a lot of times is the length of the season, it's the prices, it's the weather, it's everything. So I think the 120 day season is justified. So 
I'm not going to support the motion, and uh, we'll see where it goes. Um, I'm uh, likewise uh, uh, not going to support the motion. I, uh, I, I think that um, you know, everything's been presented that the 120-day uh, season is, uh, uh, is uh, reasonable, and, and that's what the uh, sportsman group wants. So that's going to be what I'm going to support. Uh, further discussion? Okay, I'll uh, uh, either entertain an amendment to the motion or uh, we'll go ahead and vote on the motion. Uh, so, okay, let's go ahead and vote. Uh, all in favor of the motion, uh, raise your hand, state aye. Aye. All opposed? No? Okay. Looks like 5 3. 5 3 with uh, Rain, Shrum, and Hal uh, voting uh, yes and uh, and the remainder uh, voting no. Okay, that means we need to have another motion. I'll make a motion to uh, have Bobcat and Fox season uh, open November 1st, run through February 28th. Uh, 29th, last day. 29th. I'm sorry. Last day. Last day, last day, last day, last day of February. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and that's my motion. Second. We have a motion a second. Uh, any uh, discussion on uh, on the motion? Commissioner McNinch. You know, I find it really ironic that I get stuck in the middle of this anyway. So, <laughs> I hope we come up with a really good model <laughs> for this. This isn't exactly where I like to be, but um, you know, I've made. You know, I've always been supportive of the of biology. Um, you know, my tendency would be to, to go with staff on this um, to the 19th, um, understanding that there's a lot of variables going on. And I do understand the thought process that's being used for the, uh, um, you know, that there's a lot of cats out there that aren't being uh, pushed and that there's a lot of habitat and stuff. But uh, um, I really hope that we get some kind of model working that we can deviate from this and we can all get on the same page. So, I'll support the motion, but it's not one of my favorites today. Uh, Commissioner Drew. My inclination would typically be to uh, go with the department on this, especially with the CAB support. Uh, but given the information that was presented today and the fact uh, that the department feels 120 day season will not have a biological impact, um, I think I'm going to support this motion. But with the caveat that, again, as I've said repeatedly, we need that good information going back out to the cabs the next time we discuss this item. Okay, seeing no further uh, uh, commission comment, uh, I'll go ahead and call for the vote. Uh, all in favor of the motion, uh, raise your hand, state aye. 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 All opposed? Unanimous, state zero. <coughs> Okay, I think at this point, uh, uh, Chris, you're up on the, uh, on the wood duck cut project. Uh, I'll tell you what, let's take a 10 minute break and uh, everybody, uh, uh, well, uh,